launch conductor in um, mission control. We, we pause at this moment in our countdown to remember and honor the lives of each of the participants on the Celestis Memorial space flight. Their presence on this flight signifies a commitment to the opening of the space frontier shared by all of us. We wish the friends and families present today and all those who are with us in spirit all over the world, Godspeed, good luck, and our thanks for allowing us to share this very personal time with you today. Elsie out. Five vehicles armed. Three, two, one, fire. Missile away. And good evening, everyone. Uh, I guess I can say happy Monday. Um, my name is Mark Lee, and I'm your ambassador with Celestis. We have uh, another monthly show here, although we kind of took a COVID-19 break uh, last month, and uh, we have returned to give you more updates about upcoming flights, and we have a special guest that we're gonna talk to you about later. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to introduce to you our boss, head guru, Head man in charge, Charles Chafer uh, of Celestis. Hey, Charles, how you doing? I'm good, Mark. We're uh, here in COVID crazy Houston, but uh, knock on wood, we're all well and happy to see you and uh, happy to uh, join the this show this evening. Yeah, uh, I like to also inform people that uh, you can come on a uh, line here and you can post any questions you may have. Uh, Charles is going to give us some very important information on our future flights. Uh, but if you have any questions whatsoever, our Celestis team is actually here online with us to answer any questions you may have if we ourselves don't know them. Um, so welcome once again. We're also being shown on our YouTube channel, our Celestis YouTube channel. So if you know of anyone with an earshot or telephone call that you want to get them online right away to view uh, the information that we have forthcoming, uh, you can go ahead and tell them that to reach out to our YouTube channel and take a look. We'll also be loading. This is a, a, a live broadcast, but it is taped as well. So we will be uploading this broadcast immediately after the show or soon after, possibly uh, later in the evening or first thing in the morning. And you can look at this, watch this again um, and, and update yourself on the information uh, that we're giving you today. Hey, Charles, I know we missed a month, uh, but a, a lot of things have happened within that month. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, a few items that you want to tell the audience about. And if so, go for it. Thanks, Mark. Well, first, I want to wish everybody a happy 51st anniversary. Uh, it was 51 years ago today that Neil Armstrong stepped out on the surface of the moon. And uh, I'm old enough to remember being a high school kid and watching that fuzzy black and white picture and uh, feeling like the world was was coming closer together. And certainly that's what a lot of people say has happened uh, with spaceflight, with the Apollo missions, and uh, all of us that are involved in the space program, and I say that writ large, are riding on the uh, shoulders of the men and women of the uh, early days, both in Russia and in the United States. And uh, it was a very amazing event that we did. And uh, we'll get back to some of those amazing events. We won't always be um, battling for our existence. Um, so wanted to say that. Um, as, as Mark said, we did take a COVID break uh, last month. Uh, we've heard from a lot of folks and uh, a lot of questions about what, if anything's going to happen to the Celestis 2020 launch schedule as a result of the pandemic. And of course, the first and most correct answer is, I have no idea. Um, however, I do know a few things. Um, the first is that uh, our Horizon flight, which is our next Earth orbital mission, 
is still scheduled for December, no earlier than December of this year. We've completed a lot of our work with our uh, provider, Spaceflight Inc., who is launching their first Sherpa uh, orbital transfer vehicle, uh, and we're a uh, passenger on that Sherpa vehicle, along with, I believe it's 16 satellites at this point, on that mission, which is called Transporter One, uh, and it is a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch scheduled for the Cape. Uh, and no changes uh, uh, to date on that launch. Um, we still are taking some re taking reservations for that mission. Right now, we say that those close out um, August 1st, which isn't all that long from now. We may get a little bit of dispensation, but we're pretty much scheduled to send everybody, all of our participants to Seattle where the payload integration will occur. That will be in um, September. So uh, for those of you who are on the flight, I can't tell you what kind of activities will be there. I can say that if we're, if we're unless they've shut it down completely, we'll be there figuring out a way to host you. And if they've shut it down completely, thank goodness for the internet. We will be live uh, not only with a memorial service and a pre-launch program, but also of course with the launch events. And that's for the Horizon flight. Uh, which we're very excited about. Um, however, we also have a mission for our Earthrise service called the Aurora flight, which is was until just recently scheduled also for the month of December. And that would have been a real test of your uh, staff at Celestis to pull two launches off in a month. However, we got word from our launch service provider up aerospace that due to COVID, they have moved that launch, the Aurora flight, uh, until spring of 2021. So we set out, if you're on the flight or you're registered with us in any way, you've gotten a communication already about that. Uh, and of course, we will uh, keep you fully up to date on the Aurora flight. Um, so that's the 2020 missions, one remaining one in Horizon December. The Aurora has moved to spring. And uh, I, I think I'll stop at that point. I know a lot of people have questions about our upcoming Luna mission. What I can tell you is that we'll have a lot of news for you about that uh, next month's um, uh, Facebook Live event, and uh, the news is good. <laughs> and uh, we're getting very excited about going to the moon uh, for our second time. Uh, the Voyager mission is still holding at late 2022, and we'll be releasing more details on that mission as, as appropriate. We've also gone ahead and scheduled our next Earth orbital flight called Excelsior, and that will be in late, mid to late 2022, uh, also from Cape Canaveral. So we have a, a full manifest coming up. Um, all of that information is always first posted on our website, on our social media networks, and then, of course, through our Facebook Live events. So that's that's the uh, that's the update from Celestis World Headquarters. At least my house version of Celestis World Headquarters. We do still have our office open, uh, and uh, uh, one staff member uh, occupies it. The balance of the team is still working remotely, as we want to ensure everyone's health and well-being. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. We have a wonderful special guest uh, to spend some time with this evening. I will say a very good friend of mine, someone I've known uh, at least since the 70s, not to date either of us, but um, uh, really excited about having uh, our current guest. And Mark, 
if you'd like to take it away at this point. Hey, uh, Charles, thank you so much. And if there are any questions to anything that Charles has just given you, uh, please go ahead and post uh, on our Facebook page or right here in this broadcast. And after we're, we have uh, concluded with our incredible guest that we're about to introduce you to, uh, we'll go ahead and try and field some of those questions. Um, bear in mind that all your questions will be answered, whether here live or later on our Facebook page. So there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, if you're curious about anything about our launches, our history of our launches, anything uh, that you know or do not know of Celestis, uh, please inquire. Um, don't guess. Um, ask us. Uh, we have a 20-year a, a track, track record. Uh, we're very good at what we do. Actually, we're the best at what we do. Um, so please, you're in good hands. So go ahead and, and don't be afraid to post or ask any questions uh, that you may have. They will be answered. Okay. This next gentleman that I'm going to bring to you up on the screen as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, his name is Alan Ladwick. And let me tell you a little bit about Alan. He is, Alan has more than 30 years of experience as a senior manager of programs and policy development associated with the US civil space program. He has served in senior man management positions with nonprofit organizations, private sector, and the federal government. Ladwick has extensive experience in strategic planning, policy development, educational activities, promotion, government affairs, and activities that directly involve the public in space activities. Uh, right now, we're here to produce, or I'm sorry, to actually uh, debut uh, a little bit of what Alan is doing with a book he's just uh, written. So I'm going to introduce you to Alan. I'm bringing him up to the screen as we speak. Hey, Alan, can you hear us? Hey, Charlie. Are you good? Can you hear us fine? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. yes, absolutely. Sometimes we may have some audio uh, problems here. Um, Alan, it is such a pleasure to have you here. You, you have, uh oh, what's that? <laughs> Hold on, let me let me put Charlie on uh, both. I can go back and forth. <laughs> Alan, hold that up for a bit. So this wonderful book, okay? See you in orbit, our dream of space flight. Um, I'm very, very curious at how you came about uh, with this title and its subject matter and uh, anything else you can tell us because we're going to have a lot of questions as soon as you give us a little bit of an introduction to what you produce. Okay, thanks, Mark. Well, first of all, I want to thank Charlie. As he mentioned, he and I have been friends since the mid-70s. I also worked for Charlie for a time in the early 2000s with one of his other commercial space projects, and he's a true commercial space pioneer. He was launching commercial rockets before anybody ever heard of Elon Musk. Uh, so he, we, we've been longtime friends. I really appreciate this opportunity. You talk about a COVID uh, downturn. I haven't been able to do a public presentation. I did a few podcasts, but on my book since March because of COVID. And if there's one thing that will kill book sales, it's not being able to get out and talk about the book and signing books. Uh, my last presentation was in Boulder at the beginning of March for the Suborbital Space Researchers Conference. So when Charlie offered me this opportunity to join you all tonight, I did not hesitate to say yes. Uh, so the way the book came about, it was a long, long process, over 30 years. I was the manager of the NASA Space Flight Participant Program, which included the Teacher in Space and Journalist in Space programs. And that started in 1984 was when it was announced. In fact, uh, this week, 30, 35 years ago, was when Krista McAuliffe, the teacher in space, and Barbara Morgan, the backup teacher, were announced at a ceremony at the White House. So this is very timely. In addition to the Apollo uh, 51st anniversary, uh, I'm celebrating the 35th anniversary of the teacher in space activity. So I was the guy that used to get all the letters from the public, from people that wanted to fly on the space shuttle. Now, mind you, and for those of you that weren't born yet in 1984, we didn't have email back then. So all the correspondence was hard written, you know, hard copy letters. And I got over 10,000 letters from people. And initially I used to try to answer, answer each one, you know, personally, but it, it just got to be too much. So we had to do form letters at a certain point. 
But we heard from every category of uh, occupation that you can imagine. And this even was true after President Reagan announced that the first space flight participant would be a teacher. That did not hold people back from writing to us and asking for their chance to fly. So we started with the teacher in space. Uh, we had uh, two finalists from every state uh, and the District of Columbia, overseas school, DOD schools. We ended up with 112 finalists. They all came to DC in June of 1985 for a, a one week uh, conference and national selection panel. That was narrowed down to a group of 10. I took those 10 around to the NASA Human Space Flight Centers for orientation, brought them back to headquarters, and that's when they met with a committee to be voted on, and that's how Krista and Barbara were selected. Then, because the announcement had been made by the White House, the White House also wanted to announce Krista as the winner, so we were there in the Roosevelt Room. Uh, President Reagan had been in the hospital at the time undergoing surgery. I forget what the issue was. So Vice President George Bush was the one that made the announcement. In addition to Bar Krista and Barbara, James Beggs, the administrator at the time, uh, also made the 10 finalists uh, employees of NASA for a year so they could continue to work with NASA. And he announced that all 112 uh, state finalists were space ambassadors. To this day, many of those teachers are still functioning under that title and helping NASA education. In fact, I did a Zoom meeting with them just a few weeks ago to commemorate the 35th anniversary of that conference. So because I got all those letters from people, I saw their dreams, I saw their aspirations. Then I came across letters that people wrote to Robert Goddard in the 1920s when he first speculated about a rocket to the moon. He was besieged with letters from volunteers wanting to go on his rocket to the moon. And this was, you know, just theoretical. It wasn't even a real thing yet. But hundreds of people wrote to him. I compared those letters to the letters I got. And then I came across letters from 1950 that people wrote to the Hayden Planetarium. In, uh, in the spring of 1950, the Hayden Planetarium in New York City sponsored a lecture by Willie Lay, a German historian, called Conquest of Space. And as a, a kind of a promotional activity, they put up a, an interplanetary tour reservation booth in the lobby. And they handed out a reservation form and said, where would you like to go? The moon, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, estimated departure, 1975. Well, over the next three years, there were 800 people that could fit in that auditorium. Over the next three years, they got 22,000 letters from people around the world wanting to sign up for those flights. They received a little reservation card, some nice materials. And then, since we're talking about the 51st anniversary of Apollo 11, in that time frame, in 1968, Pan American Airways put out a uh, promotion called first uh, the first moon flights club and this was a spin-off because of the movie 2001 space odyssey and what do we remember about that movie they had a, a pan am clipper shuttle coming out of the space station they had a hilton hotel over the three-year period that that promotion took off with their slogan of who's the only airline with a waiting line to the moon 93 thousand people signed up. That's a year that started a year before Apollo 11. So when I was the head of space flight participant program, people would send me copies of their reservation card from the Hayden, their first moon flights reservation card from Pan Am to see if they could turn those in. I was so overwhelmed by the passion, by the yearning people had to fly in space and if you would put these letters on a table and just lay them out, you wouldn't be able to tell what year they were written. The letters that Robert Goddard got in the 20s had the same motivation as people in the uh, 50s, as people in the 60s, as people in the 80s that used to write to me. So I had, seen, had copies of those letters. 
And I decided that there's a story here. And I tried to do this over 20 years ago, but I didn't have a good ending because 20 years ago, there wasn't a good ending. It was still just a dream. It was a lot of speculation about space uh, tourism with no ability to deliver the goods. So I picked it up again just a few years ago because Virgin Galactic came on the scene, Blue Origin, uh, SpaceX, all these people started talking again about space tourism. So the book, See You in Orbit, Our Dream, and I put a question mark on that because it remains to be seen if that's going to become a common salutation, Our Dream of Space Flight. And I, I've been working on that for a long time. I published it last October. And actually, not that much has changed since then, again, because of COVID, because one of the things you'll see in the book is that we have a lot of promises about things that are going to happen with a lot of delays about when it's going to happen. This is what Elon Musk refers to as aspirational goals. So we're already some 10 to 12 years behind schedule for Virgin Galactic. Blue Origin has kind of been pushing it back. Both those companies thought they'd be flying by now in 2020. Uh, and I kind of you know, referred to that in the book. But I'm beginning to wonder if we'll go through 2020 with either one of them offering commercial uh, suborbital flights. I hope so, but I'm not seeing any real firm indication at the moment. So the book then tells that history from the 1920s up to the present. What was the, what was the history? What's a glimpse at the future? Who all is talking about space tourism? And then the other thing I tried to do with the book is overlay. Well, here's what people were saying about space tourism and, and dreaming about tourism. Here's what was really happening in space travel at the time. So, for example, in the early 60s, the National Group Geographic Society uh, submitted a proposal to NASA to fly a National Geographic photojournalist on a Gemini mission. Now, at that time, there had only been, I forget, it was either six or eight successful human flights. Can you imagine, and Charlie, especially you, since you were new Deke Slayton and worked for him very well, can you imagine how the Gemini or the astronauts at that time would have reacted and said, oh yeah, let's bring on board a, a civilian and put him in the second seat of the Gemini capsule. <laughs> Needless to say, that didn't happen. But the fact that it was proposed was at a time when we had this limited experience and it was just a couple of years before the famous incident on a Gemini mission where Neil Armstrong and David Scott lost control of their capsule and it was going, and you know, ass over tea kettle when they tried to hook up with a, another spacecraft. And only because of Neil Armstrong's great pilot skills did they not uh, perish in that flight. So what you see throughout the book is, okay, here's what's being said about space tourism. Here's what's actually happening. So I, sorry if that was a rather long-winded answer to your opening question, but I'm pretty passionate about the topic, and uh, th that's really how it all came about. I, I, I'm gobsmacked. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've been sitting here writing questions like you wouldn't believe just on the bit that you've told us thus far. Uh, obviously, we have people in our chat room who's, uh, who's commenting on the book as well. Uh, if you don't mind, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, Actually, I got a bunch, but let me just start with the first one here. And anyone else who has questions, please go ahead and post them right away uh, so we can go ahead and, and uh, get those answers for you. Uh, you had mentioned the Goddard letters. Uh, you mentioned the fact that you found those Goddard letters. Uh, was that in 1984 when you found the Goddard letters? Uh, that was probably more in 1989. I didn't really start the book until uh, the end of 89, beginning of 1990. I actually resigned my civil service position at NASA to go work on the book at that time. And I, I forget where I came across. I think there was a book uh, about Goddard that I found them and I contacted the Goddard library and they shared some of those with me. OK, and, and I'll ask another question. I'll let Charlie speak. Um, in those letters, were there any recognizable names? I mean, now that we're in 2020 from back then, were there any? And I know there were, you know, thousands of letters, but anything that pops out at you? Yes, uh, uh -huh. mainly a, a senator. Well, first of all, people started writing to Robert Goddard and, uh, excuse me, my cord fell out. Uh, 
the letters, uh, some of his letters went to the wrong Goddard. Uh, one of the letters went to uh, Charles Goddard in New York City. He was the author of Perils of Pauline and the Exploration of <laughs> Lane. And um, he got a letter. So he forwarded to Harold Goddard of Swarthmore College, which was also the wrong Goddard. And in his letter, uh, Charles Goddard said, by the way, what's become of the rocket project? I'm sure there are many great people who would be glad to contribute a dollar or two as a sporting event to see how far it would go. I suggest you send a passenger, Senator Royal S. Copeland, who would love the publicity. The sovereign state of New York would be quite willing to let you have them. And there was also another one about Henry Cabot Lodge. At any rate, squeeze in Henry Cabot Lodge uh, if you could spare the room. Uh, neither suggestion said anything about bringing them back. Um, <laughs> And, and the thing that got me was the people who wrote to Goddard, some of their motivations. Uh, volunteers saw space travel as a way to add meaning to their lives. Dr. Franz von Hoffet, for him, space travel way, was a way to do something worthwhile. In our poor little country, men have nothing more that makes their life worth living. The honorous first chauffeur of a rocket to the moon, at least, would give me something of the kind. <laughs> Similarly, a guy from Finland said he was willing to risk his life for the implementation of your scheme if Goddard could only find a use for him. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, Charlie, you have a question before I uh, put this uh, gentleman's question on the screen? Yeah, a couple. Um, so it's interesting, and for those of us that have been at it for a long time, the dichotomy between the clear desire on the part of people to go to space and the clear inability to provide the funding that will allow them to do that. And my question has to do with price point. So anybody with 20 million bucks these days <laughs> can ride to, you know, the space station, get in line. Uh, other ticket prices, a uh, quarter of a million dollars. I see there's a new balloon to orbit, or not to orbit, right. balloon, balloon to almost space. Almost, right. 100 and a quarter. What's the price point that's going to open the door for, for, and there's probably, it's a long way away from routine space travel, but, you know, it's seemingly Virgin Galactic's had about 600 people signed up for 10 years. And you don't see that number growing a lot. I think that's mostly because people are waiting to see the flight. But I'm really curious in terms of what 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 do you think the price point is? And then to a corollary to question, uh, you can do a luxury around the world air trip now in the 10 to 15 grand range. What do you what's your opinion about point to point? Uh, via rocketry and whether you think that's a really uh, potential large opportunity? Well, great, great questions, of course. Um, first of all, I didn't get into point to point in the book because there wasn't a lot being said about that when I was writing. That would have been taking me down yet another avenue. I mean, the book was already 500 pages long. I had to cut out a lot of stories. So that was one thing I didn't get into. To answer your first question about price point, the historic price point that I see the most often is $50,000. That's been said though for the last 30 years. And even Virgin Galactic that started off at 200,000, raised it to 250,000. And I thought I read somewhere recently where they said it might even go higher. You know, we're going in the wrong direction here, folks. We need to be coming down. So, uh, and I don't care if Elon Musk says he can take people to Mars for $100,000. I don't believe it. And uh, if he could, more power to everybody. But um, 50000 seemed to be the milestone that everybody was kind of shooting for. Now, is that going to happen anytime soon? You know, I, I think we're probably a good five years away at a minimum from realizing that price point. I hope I'm wrong. But historic, again, go back and read the history. Uh, 
you can say, you know, look, there were senior managers at NASA that said the space shuttle was going to fly for $25 or $50 a pound. Wow. And uh, be exporting them. Two to 300 times a year. Yeah, I got yeah. Well, at least 60 times a year. I got and, old boat stories when we were in the rocket business back in the 80s. Right. So, uh, you know, the thing about aerospace people, the space advocates, we're all very optimistic, clearly. And we want these things to happen so bad that sometimes I think our our vision and our our dreams get disconnected a little bit from reality. So yeah. I, I will refer you to a point in the book that uh, Pat, Dr. Patrick Collins, he's at the University of Japan and one of the leading researchers on space tourism. And back in the 80s, he wrote, uh, he, he described what he saw as a market demand phased approach. And that's, I tried to, uh, to mimic that in the book because I think it was a good approach. And Dr. Uh, Collins thought that uh, there'd be a pioneering phase. And remember, this was from 1986. Pioneering phase, ticket prices would set you back 100,000 to a million. The exclusive phase, 10,000 to 100,000. The mature phase uh, become more affordable with a ride ranging 2,000 to 10,000 with a mass market phase of only 2,000. Well, that, that's in my budget. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, his phases are correct. I just yeah. think you have to radically update the dollar figures for his tickets. So I would say the ultimate mass market phase is going to be probably closer to 50000 And even that's going to be a stretch. I, I, I'm willing to debate that with anybody. I, I'd love to be proven wrong. Uh, Charlie, again, I, I mentioned Deke Slayton who was asked to comment on uh, a company in the mid nineties, uh, I want to say maybe the eighties uh, uh, society expeditions. And they were talking about a flight uh, five to eight orbits around the earth for $50,000. And uh, they interviewed Deke to ask him what he said about it. And his response was, where's the rocket? <laughs> you know, we, we see a lot of view graphs. We don't see a lot of hardware. Yeah. Right. Well, we, we know space is hard. And Deke, if anything, knowing him for more than a decade, as I did, um, was definitely from Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we've got some, we've got some questions oh, yeah. from uh, folks we know and folks we don't know. And I'm, uh, I, but Mark, why don't you take Jack and Jan's question? And I will. Yeah. I shall. Uh, Alan, uh, uh, the first part of this question is a request, a personal request. Uh, the full question can't be shown on the screen due to the limitations of the software, uh, but I will read them out to you. Uh, ba basically, Alan is asking, will you autograph a couple of books if I purchase them direct for an old Virginian? Uh, for Jack <laughs> Kennedy, of course. <laughs> and then here comes the second Jack part. Second. Jack uh, contacted me on a direct message I'll send you my address. If you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, I can send you a little insert that you can paste on the title page. That's the easiest way to do it, unless we can figure out a way to get together. Yeah, and Jack, send a check. I'm his agent right now, okay? So his second half of his question says, secondly, in having political and technological insight, where will human insight be in 2026, commercial, civil, military, from your perch of experience. So where would, uh, what would your human insight be around 2026? I don't know how he came up with that year, but uh, maybe you well, can. Because he's an aerospace guy and he's followed this stuff, he's probably adding two years to the 2024 landing that NASA says we're gonna do on the moon. Uh -huh. um, I would, you know, I hope that NASA can meet the 2024 uh, goal to put a woman and man on the moon. I don't see the budget following that track of what is needed, uh, especially with the COVID downturn and some of the delays that have happened. So maybe in 2026, you might see a return to the moon. Certainly, it looks as though there's a lot of these robotic activities that are happening, uh, Astrobotics and some of the other companies that want to put landers on the moon. Uh, Charlie, is that are you going to do something with Astrobotics for Celeste? I, I can't announce anything yet. Uh, 
tune in next Sorry. month. But uh, the CLIPS program, the commercial land air yeah. payload service program that NASA came up with, which I think is a multi-billion dollar 10-year program, has, has turned lunar dreams into lunar reality. Yeah. And in fact, we will be flying with CLIPS providers. And we're very excited about um, that. Uh, and uh, I'll just note here, it's, she doesn't really have a question, but Jan Taylor joins us. She uh, recently signed up her husband, her late husband for our Luna mission. Tony was quite uh, an amazing man. He's the only person on the planet that can claim to have navigated a spaceship around all of the planets of the solar system, Pluto included. So um, he worked at JPL for a number of years and, and Jan said that she and uh, Tony uh, signed up to try to be the first married mission specialist oh. on the show. <laughs> and uh, we welcome her and uh, happy that, that she's with us. That, that's I, great, Jan. We, we had a lot of people that volunteered to be a husband and wife. And then on top of that, to have their baby in space on the space shuttle. <laughs> well, that'll make news in, uh, I think, every corner of uh, you know, media. Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, uh, Brian McPhee basically said, five years away. I still doubt the moon landing will happen in five years. I think it will happen uh, within five I hope so. Uh, as I said, at least the robotic things will happen. Also in that five-year time frame, it's potential that maybe they'll be the first space tourist at one of these hotels, be it uh, Axiom, which is, I think, run by some pretty credible people, former manager of the space station. Uh, I think they've had a good systematic approach. They've got an approval with NASA to uh, dock at the space station. Uh, Elon Musk has talked about sending people up, I think, to the station, uh, at least, or orbiting. Then he's got this... Uh, a crew of eight people that's going to go orbit the moon. I don't believe that'll happen quite on the time frame he says, but maybe within the next five to eight years. So there's going to be a lot of things happening. I mean, the good news is there, there's going to be so much going on and it's no longer just NASA. It's a lot of commercial companies. It's a lot of uh, other countries now involved. You know, remember uh, 51 years ago, Sorry, my cord keeps coming out. Uh, 51 years ago, it was Russia and America doing space stuff. Now, it's like over 100 countries have space programs. You know, yeah. United Arab Emirates just launched to Mars yesterday. Yeah. Um, so there's and a I'm, lot going on. I'm very, I'm optimistic about uh, the future of space. I, I have my own moment, moments of cynicism when I see budget cuts, when I see, you know, oh, we, we can't go to the moon. We need to go straight to Mars. Moon's the detour, uh, but Mars, oh, then it's like, why go to Mars? You can do that with robots. I'm tired of all the debate. I just want things to happen. And it seems as though a lot of, of companies and countries are putting things uh, on the horizon to, to make some reality. So I'm very optimistic about the next, if not the next five years, certainly the next 10. And even more so, I would say the next 30, I think a lot of cool stuff that, that people have been dreaming about for hundreds of years is going to happen. They all aren't going to succeed. There'll be some setbacks. Yeah, absolutely. But you're absolutely correct. Um, e more so today than ever, the government, God bless them, doesn't have enough money to do everything. And the commercial folks are, are filling in the gaps and coming and they're letting markets drive um, what they do, which in my way of thinking is, a, it's not the only way to get to space. Clearly science and national pride and exploration are all really important, but being able to show returns on investment creates long-term yeah. space activity. And I wanna bring it around just a little bit for a moment to Celestis. You were kind enough to mention Celestis in your book and to talk about it as a, uh, well, if you, if you haven't been able to get there while you're alive kind of thing, 
to me, and we've had Frank White on this um, uh, Facebook Live event also, the, the driver of the, the overview effect um, is a lot of what causes people to want to go to space, but it's also there, and this is what Frank said in an article he wrote about us, you see that same phenomenon in the desire to experience remembering dad or mom or your son through a Celestis mission, that the same sorts of motivations that cause us as humans to want to reach outward cause us to want to have our memorial services. I, I can say when I started Celestis, uh, one of the thoughts I had was, geez, well, we'll all be going to space in a few years. So my, you know, maybe the market for the company is only going to last a little while. And then, of course, we've we've sent two astronauts and families of astronauts to space. So I think the the motivation for becoming a spacefaring society crosses multiple boundaries. And I just wonder about your thoughts on that, Al. Well, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I that was going to be the next thing I was going to ask if I could just read real quick. I, I cover Celestis in towards the end of the book under a section called Dearly Beloved. And I said, should you come to the end of the road and still not have achieved your dream of space flight, take heart. While you won't consciously make the trip, you can make arrangements to have your cremains or DNA make the journey with the assessments of Celestis. And then I talk about how Charlie's been leading this effort, all the different places you launch from. And I especially want your potential customers to know about your memorial services, if you don't mind if I uh, plug you a bit, but included in the compact to fly their beloved, their loved ones is a solemn yet celebratory memorial service for the families of the deceased on the day of deployment near the launch site. Guests also receive briefings on current and future space activities. I was invited to speak at one of these services and I was overwhelmed by the spiritual and emotional sincerity of the event and the camaraderie that developed among the participants. That that program, and it was out when you did a flight out of uh, Vandenberg, yep. really struck me with the, the, uh, the string quartet playing. And then to give everybody a chance to step up and say some words about their loved one that was on the flight. It was a moving emotional experience and it was a perfect way to send their loved ones off on your flight. So I, and I had to include that in the book because I think, as you said, it, it's part of the dream to fly. It's part of, of how we see things. Uh, Frank White talks about the overview effect. Ron Guerin talks about the orbital perspective. A professor from the University of South Australia, professor of, professor of tourism, Dr. Mariana Signala, talks about it this way. People will want to go to space for all sorts of reason, adventure, spiritual wonder, even to gain fame and celebrity. And they will be willing to pay a lot of money for that experience and the service around it. She describes the, the uh, probable impact it, similarly to the overview effect. She says space tourism falls in the category is what, what is known as transformational services, which are consumed not just to satisfy a basic survival need. Transformational services enable people to rethink and reset their value system, their priorities, their way of thinking, to learn and to self-develop, to change their attitude, mindsets, or their behavior or perception about certain things. And I certainly think we've seen a lot of astronauts, especially from the Apollo era, that have come back and have shared those experiences and how it changed them. Also, the uh, shuttle astronauts to a certain extent. Can we see that same thing happen with suborbital flight? Uh, I, remains to be seen. Beth Moses from Virgin Galactic says that she did experience that when she flew last year, or was it, yeah, last year, uh, on a uh, suborbital flight. So we'll see uh, what happens. Uh, by the way, the other thing I want to mention, especially since we're talking about a five-year time frame, and I don't think I got this in the book because I think I thought of it afterwards, but I believe that once suborbital flights start actually 
going on a regular basis, we'll kind of forget about all the delays and the, the 10 years of promises and the, the deadlines not met because it's finally here. And we'll look forward instead of looking backwards. We won't be complaining that it didn't happen. We'll be celebrating that it's happening. Oops. Mark got quiet on us. We don't hear you, Mark. Oh, because I muted myself so you could talk. <laughs> um, uh, Alan, what I wanted to ask is, uh, and I'm going to put this up on the screen here. Can I get a uh, web, web address or anything that people can visit you at? Uh, yeah, I've got a website that I set up to start to add information to where the book ended. Uh, it's it's www.2orbitproductions.com. I must admit that I've not done a very good job of updating because, frankly, I just got burned out from writing, uh, from not being able to get out to promote it. And so I'm behind the times a little bit. But this next week, I'm going to get on it. I'm going to put a lot of updates of what has happened since I finished writing the book. Uh, there'll be information about upcoming talks. Um, it's also, I think, it'd be a connection to my uh, Facebook website, toorbitproductions.com. If anybody is interested in space art, a lot of this art behind me is stuff that I did. And um, uh, so that's one way to get it. And then the book itself is only available on Amazon. Uh, so it's uh, See You in Orbit, our, our Orbit, Our Dream of Space Flight. And it's available in Kindle for, I think it's $12, and a soft cover copy for $18. Excellent. Uh, it'd be unfair. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. That website is Two Orbit Production. Yeah, two Orbit. Oh, I had Tor. Didn't yeah, I? Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I slurred. <laughs> yeah, you. you, you two Orbit Productions. Hey, there's another question that came in. I wanted to get Alan's opinion on. Uh, was when do you think there'll be hotels in low Earth orbit? Well, as I said. Uh, Axiom is uh, saying that they might be up within the next two to three years with, I don't know how many people they can put in that capsule they have at the station, but their plan is to have their own capsule. Uh, but, you know, it, it's an expensive ticket. Uh, uh, Axiom, I think, is $50 million, and that's just the transportation cost. Uh, then NASA, if you're going to be at the space station, is going to charge you $34,000 a night which covers air, uh, using the bathroom, I guess Wi-Fi. Um, so it's not, a, it's not an inexpensive ticket. Are there enough people out there to create a market for that? Well, these people aren't fools. I suspect they've done their marketing studies. I'll tell you one thing I was disappointed in when I was writing the book is I tried to get uh, Bigelow Aerospace, Robert Bigelow. Uh, or Yeah, yeah Bigelow. Um, yeah. And he wanted to do a space hotel. Of course, he's had two capsules, uh, on, uh, not with any crew on board for many years now, Genesis 1 and 2. And then he was going to take that uh, technology and have his own uh, space hotel. During the COVID, unfortunately, I believe they've kind of gone out of business or at least laid a lot of people off. And I'm not quite sure if they're going to recover. But he was the one that a lot of people were putting their money on because he had the deepest pocket and the most experience with inflatable structures for when he bought the te uh, TransHab technology. There are some other companies that have announced it. I've seen, you know, wheeled uh, space stations that they're going to have. I, I'm skeptical of any of the time frames other than uh, Axiom in the short term for a couple people to the space station. I would have to believe we're at least 10 years away from a functioning space station. Again, I hope somebody proves me wrong and does it a lot sooner. But uh, remember, there was only about eight people that went to ISS as tourists through space adventures. Uh, so is there going to be enough of a market to pay even more than people paid uh, the Russians to fly to the space station to go and have a, a space hotel. But, you know, the dream lives. I, I hope it happens. Uh, I see something here uh, from Beth Ann Blackburn. She says, I'm hoping to send my husband on one of your missions. He was a sidewalk astronomer. 
Okay, I get it. Uh, he enjoyed sharing the knowledge of both lunar and deep space. He also said he loved to travel to the moon. Um, so since we are talking about commercial flight, uh, it seems that, uh, Beth, you might still be able to go. <laughs> you know, but uh, we're, we're, we're honored that you're sending your husband uh, on these flights that we have upcoming. Uh, Alan, I see if there's anybody that's interested in your book, you can uh, see you in orbit. Uh, let's see, find it here, WW, okay, on the Amazon site, if you guys can see that up there now. The rest of it says, of course, see you, is it not see you in orbit, or is it actually see you orbit dream space flight? See you in orbit, question okay. mark. So it is see you in orbit, dream space flight. And uh, like we said before, you can find that also on his uh, website. And, and the goal here is to get to the see you in orbit without the question mark. Right, <laughs> without the question mark. With an explanation point. Yes, 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 yes. Boy, this has been fabulous. Uh, anything else you have, Charles? Just want to say I've read the book. I actually oh. I had a chance to get Alan's personal autograph when he was oh. down here in Houston for a, for a, uh, a visit. And uh, there ain't anything else like it out there. It is re really, Alan is the only one who could have written this book. And as a result, I uh, highly recommend it's on my shelf and uh, it's a little bit dog-eared because of uh, looking up that stuff and using it as a, as a reference. And we're, we're pleased you were able to join us tonight. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess my last question is what's the next book? <laughs> <laughs> well, next one, I'm going to have to have a publisher. I, you know, unfortunately, over that 30 year period, I just couldn't interest anybody in the topic. Uh, they seem to be more interested in astronaut stories. One uh, well known agent said, Well, it kind of sounds like a long magazine article. You know, it's 500 pages long. Uh, uh, another person said, Well, it's, the story sounds too familiar. I, I've heard all this before. Well, I don't know where, I haven't seen it. Yeah. So I do think. Uh, I don't know there'll be a book. It may be a long magazine article. will be, okay, what's happening now once stuff starts to fly? And I'm hoping other people will add to the literature. There isn't a lot of literature about space tourism uh, out there. So I'm hoping other people will tell other stories. I mean, I had dozens of other stories I couldn't even get to. I mean, Lori Garver, former deputy administrator of NASA, had her gallbladder taken out so she could be an astronaut and fly with the Russians. I, I couldn't get into that because then I would have had to start, tell the story of Lance Bass from- Right, I was gonna say she was gonna fly with the Russians. Yeah, the boy right. band, and that was <laughs> another story. And then there was some journalist that said they had a deal with Sean O'Keefe, the administrator of NASA in the early 2000s, and, and they had a deal that they were gonna donate money to the Challenger Center and he would fly as the first journalist, which I can guarantee you would have lit the hair on fire of all the journalists and space finalists. <laughs> so there's a lot of stories out there to tell. I'm hoping other people will join in and help tell those stories. There's even uh, down at the uh, Emory Riddle University. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons I re got re-inspired to write was uh, 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 Robert Golich is a professor. He lives in Germany, but he does a online course on space tourism and he wrote a textbook about it and the the students were so excited about my stories that they inspired me to get back and finish the book so i i look forward to other courses in college you know i, I think space uh, space station management as a as a master's course would be fabulous someday and so uh, i'm very big on where this is all going I got into space in 1970 with a, the, one of the first space advocacy groups called the Committee for the Future. It was Barbara. run by Barbara Marks Hubbard, who we just lost last year, and Colonel John Whiteside, an Air, a retired Air Force colonel. And they recruited me to lead a student effort about showing space as the future. Well, and, you know, if I may, they had a what was it called? Project Harvest Project Moon. Project Harvest Moon, one of the first to buy the five and, and launch people into space. Yeah, and, and NASA laughed us out of the room at the time. <laughs> uh, but Barbara had something that she promoted back then that I think feeds in nicely with Frank White's 
uh, overview effect and with uh, Ron Guerin's orbital perspective. And that was what she referred to as the evolutionary spiral. So humanity is always moving forward, but always upward on a spiral. And we get a higher consciousness at each loop of the spiral. For her, space was a way that we'd get to a higher consciousness, that we would, uh, we would in fact change the way we see things, our values would change. And we're still a ways from that happening, but we can if a larger number of people get to fly. So I, I, I had her listed in the dedication as one of my mentors because I truly believe in the evolutionary spiral and I hope we all get there. She had a great home slash castle in, near Rock Creek Park in right. Washington, D.C. where she hosted all of us. We were younger than Alan. Yeah, <laughs> very young. Well, thank you again. Thank you. I hope we need to get you back to one of our launches and meet some of, I mean, it, it's great. At our last launch uh, on a Falcon Heavy, we had 650 guests from around the wow. world. And you, you would have loved it. And uh, so we'll we'll try to get you back down to one soon. I, it'd be a pleasure. They, they are wonderful events. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Mark. Thank oh. you who, who tuned in. Thanks. Alan, it was a, a pleasure to meet you. And I'm sure there'll be more questions uh, because people can rewatch this broadcast <clears throat> as soon as we upload it and uh, relive this great conversation. This was incredible. This was uh, probably one of my favorites, I think. This, Thank this you so much. I, I certainly enjoyed it. I can talk about this book all day. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I can't afford the lodging, but at least I can listen <laughs> to you talk about it, <laughs> you know. Uh, but everyone, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, my boss, Charles Chaper here, um, has uh, brought uh, Alan to us, and, and we are very gracious for that opportunity. Uh, you're going to have to write another book really quick, Alan. We need okay. you back, man. <laughs> see you in orbit. Yeah, see you in orbit. Uh, thank you, everyone. That was our, our broadcast for tonight. Um, we hope to see you next month where we will have uh, more information about upcoming flights. Um, we are doing our mission briefings uh, for Celestis, so you get to know a little bit more about uh, what's coming up in the future because we have a very, very busy future uh, that's coming up with our next launches and, of course, with uh, our delivery to the moon. Uh, which is going to be very, very exciting when we get a solid date uh, on that. So um, we'll have more information for you for next month. So please come by and uh, join us. And uh, yes, Beth, you are more than welcome. We appreciate it. Stay with us and we will lead out with the way we came in. So please bear with me as I get this started. Good night, everyone, and uh, stay safe. This is the launch conductor in... Uh Mission Control, we, we pause at this moment in our countdown to remember and honor the lives of each of the participants on the Celestis Memorial space flight. Their presence on this flight signifies a commitment to the opening of the space frontier shared by all of us. We wish the friends and families present today and all those who are with us in spirit all over the world Godspeed, good luck, and our thanks for allowing us to share this very personal time with you today. LCM. Five vehicles armed. Three, two, one, fire. <laughs>